Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. So are you ready to get started? I'm very ready to get started. I'm Sydney. And I'm Jess. And this is Malpractice Podcast. And you thought we were going on season three, but we surprising you. We tricked you. We tricked you. We tricked you. <laughs> we're tricky. We tricked you. <laughs> and we have a really great episode for you guys that has an interview from someone that I am newly obsessed with, <laughs> right? Correct. As you should be. She's the coolest person I've maybe ever met in my entire life. Facts. I mean, I, I don't. I don't disagree at all. You can verify? Mm-hmm. Our interview today is with Emily Nolan, who is the host of Brave Talks, a podcast sharing radical honesty and self-acceptance. She's been recognized as one of the most influential thought leaders in wellness and one of the rock star yogis leading the body positive movement by Mind and Body Green. Emily has presented in four different countries to thousands of women, students, and athletes. She regularly shares her story and message via her award-winning blog, emilynolan.com. I definitely recommend you check it out. It is so cool, and there's so much information on there. Mm -hmm. She's been featured in Elle, Cosmopolitan, Pop Sugar, 17, Women's Health, and has even appeared on the Today Show, among many other places, because like we said, she's the coolest person alive. So... If that wasn't enough, on top of all of these accomplishments, she's also a mother to a child that has some of the severe allergies we've been talking about. She's always an advocate. So she reached out to us after our first allergy episode on Instagram, and she wanted to share her story with our listeners and provide insight, information, and honestly, just a little bit of hope uh, to the allergy community and the people that support an allergy inclusive kind of lifestyle. So we always ask our listeners, reach out if they have any stories or additional information about a topic. And she was willing to share her experience. So we're super excited to bring this conversation to you, to your ear holes. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome. Welcome, Emily. Welcome, Emily. And thank you so much for being here today. I loved the podcast you guys had. So I've been doing a ton of research on food allergies. I'm writing a book called Be Pretty Brave Food Allergy Mama, which I haven't come out publicly to say yet. And I'm going to build a course for food allergy mamas too. So like right when they That's so cool. leave the um, pediatric allergist and they're feeling so much despair. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. You know, so I can talk about that. But anyway, I heard your podcast and I was like, you all did such an incredible job with information. Thank you. There's so much misinformation on the field and you just crushed it. And I was so happy that you don't have any personal experiences with food allergies and yet you had such a vested interest in it. And it was just really heartwarming to feel the inclusion because it is one of the things that we'll talk about on the podcast is how one of the biggest pieces and the biggest problems is inclusion. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so happy. It's so interesting you say that. Yeah, because we really try to cover topics, especially, right, if they don't concern us, like if we have a privilege not to be affected. Mm -hmm. It's like the reason why we started the podcast. So thank you so much. You don't know. We'll talk about this for the rest of our lives. We'll be like, remember (laughs) when Emily said? (laughs) Yeah. Also, I'm going to be tempted to cut it so it doesn't sound like I have a giant head, but Thank you so much. That's like the nicest thing anyone's ever said um, (laughs) to us. But also when we were doing the research for that episode, even some of the laws that have been formed were formed because someone messed up and a kid Mm -hmm. died because of it. And that's like the origin of most of those laws. And I found that so deeply disturbing that as a society, it, it affects like one in 13 kids. Right. And we haven't made accommodations for that. That's crazy. It is the unexplored area of the health field and because immunology is so rapidly changing and and yeah it's such a hard challenging field you know i've been to double board certified doctors who sucked and gave me misinformation and gave me yeah. a formula with an allergen in it to give to my son who was allergic to it And, you know, I told him, I was like, this, he's not allergic to it anymore, but I was like, this has fish oil in it. And he's like, oh, okay. And I was like, well, you just diagnosed him with a fish oil allergy. And he was like, 
oh, well then I guess you'll have to find like another one. I'm like, yeah, but my son has to eat in two hours. So like, you know, like you want me to stop breastfeeding now? Yeah. So it's, it's mind boggling. And then what happens is like one in 13 children have it, right? Yeah. So one in every 13 or one in every five, if you're having multiple kids, mothers are dealing with this yeah. by themselves, yeah. right? They're like winging it. Right. And then you think about under-resourced families and, mm-hmm. you know, Fortunately, we are a privileged family. We can afford therapy. We can afford going to a pediatrician. We can afford an OVQ or an EpiPen. Yeah. Two of them. And then two more for his school. Right. You know, and to keep up with the expiration dates because there's been stories of children dying because their EpiPen was five years old and they injected it and the the kid never came back and was brain dead because he drank his sister's milk. Wow. And their family was in denial had another child, couldn't keep up with all the doctor's appointments, you know, thought the EpiPen didn't have an expiration date. Doctors don't tell you this stuff. I mean, you would be so lucky to have a pediatrician or a pediatric allergist say, here's the protocol in case of an emergency, check the uh, expiration date. Yeah. You know, like the, the basic stuff, right? Right. But what I'm doing is getting into the other stuff as well and saying, how do you breathe in the moment of emergency? How do you yeah. go into function and fix it mode yeah. as a mom? You're not an EMT. Yeah. How do you go there? So I'm bringing on in my podcast on season three, a Navy SEAL to talk about how to breathe for focus and EMT and infinite swim, rescue and firefighter. Who's going to talk about the function and fix it mode and how a well-trained mind can save you. Yeah. Um, I'm bringing on all different types of people. I was a plus size model for 10 years and bringing on, you know, another plus size model to talk about how to be a rock star in inclusion, right? Like you don't have to be a food allergy Mm -hmm. mom or caregiver to be a rock star at inclusion in whatever. It could be any disability. It could be any disease, right? Like yeah. How small minded is our culture to think that I'm just going to pop a baby out? First of all, that's small minded because baby doesn't pop yeah. out. <laughs> right. But how small minded we are to think, oh, you know, like here's my Pinterest board of how my life is going to look with baby. And then things change. But we just think that our life is going to fit into this box. Yeah. Right. And again, it doesn't have to be food allergies. It could be anything. It could be type one diabetes. It could be, right. you know, autism. It, there could be so many things that you would not expect your child to have. And then you're thrown this curveball because our culture says, well, now you're different and Mm -hmm. we really don't want to include you because it's inconvenient and we're, uh, we're, it's a liability for us. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about why food, I mean, if people have heard your podcast or read your blog, they probably already know this, but can you tell our listeners a little bit more about why food allergy awareness is such an important topic for you personally? Yeah, well, my son Oliver has food allergies and he was diagnosed at seven months. His first reaction was at a restaurant and I just ordered scrambled eggs. We followed a protocol called baby led weaning, which Mm -hmm. is where you eat human food and you never do purees and the baby feeds themselves. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, we were at a restaurant, so I likely used a spoon and didn't let him like, you know, throw a scrambled egg all over the restaurant. And he just broke down to full body hives and the mm. we were with a fam with just family members and some friends and one of them said oh that happened to my kid just feed him eggs again in two weeks he'll be fine and my husband was like no that doesn't sound right I mean he was like full body hives no not at all <laughs> and I was in a state of denial so I was denying the fact that my son had food allergies because I come from a nutrition background I have a master certificate in plant-based nutrition I'm a huge well-being, if you want to call it junkie or whatever. I'm constantly researching and studying nutrition and mm-hmm. I hate to use the word buzzword clean lifestyle, but you know, simple lifestyles and I guess immunology in a way. Yeah. Um, but not specifically for food allergies. When it happened with egg, I was like, oh, you know, okay, whatever. But then following the baby led weaning protocol, you introduce a new allergen, I believe their protocol is still every two weeks, you mm-hmm. introduce something new. So you give the allergen some space and time um, to have a reaction if there ever was to be one. And I introduced peanut butter. Mm-hmm. We were having a party just with a few neighbors pre pandemic. And he had full body hives again. And Jeez. I had no 
yeah. clue. I mean, when you take those courses, they don't tell you how to respond. They say, well, if your kid has eczema, you, you might have a reaction, but like, okay, but if my kid has eczema and I give him peanut butter or like, maybe he doesn't have eczema, maybe it was just like a dry skin patch or whatever, you know, like you don't even have to have eczema to have food allergies. So like I gave him peanut butter. What's next? I mean, you could call 911 and call off the party, um, which we called off the party, but we threw him in a warm bath, which elevates your heart rate. Yeah. It was an oatmeal bath. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, something's on his skin. Yeah. Right. It's, it's like a mm-hmm. dermatitis or something crazy. I've got to put him in an oatmeal bath, like dumping oatmeal in my tub and like throwing him in a warm bath. The worst thing you can do to somebody in anaphylaxis, right. You need to like lay them down, mm-hmm. put cool rags on them, lower their heart rate, oh, wow. give them a trash TV iPad where they're like, <laughs> like sucked into this like Japanese anime or something where they never like come out of that wormhole Yeah, and stay still because you want their heart rate to lower and you want to be able to sit there and watch them right. and make sure that nothing escalates. I didn't have an EpiPen, you know, for uh, really, really young children. We use something called an AviQ. There is an EpiPen junior. Mm-hmm. They're the same thing. It's adrenaline. And so from there, I had a girlfriend I text her, her son had an almond allergy. And I was like, Hey, I think Mm -hmm. my son has a food allergy. Can you refer us to your doctor? I got an appointment there. And, you know, he was like extremely well known in the area and he uh, gave us terrible information, which is one of the messages that I want to share with other people who are going through food allergies. And also if you know someone going through food allergies, this could be a piece of information that you share with that person is don't stop looking for what you're looking for, right? Don't stop looking for what you're looking for. If you're looking for freedom or freedom from fear or a solution or um, an emergency action plan, right? Something as simple as that every Every allergist should be going over that with you. It took me eight pediatric allergists to find one who voluntarily went over an emergency action plan with me. Yeah. So that was really the beginning of my experience with food allergies and why awareness is so important to me is because I feel like our culture, our Western culture has way more way more food allergy prevalency because, you know, the cultures even like... Mm -hmm third world countries, there's not as many food allergies because these children are in the dirt all the time. They are living a dirtier life. We are so hyper sanitized that our immune systems have a hard time handling all of these allergens. Um, And I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't want to speak to that, you know, from a medical opinion, but you can listen to other medical doctors like Dr. Carrie Nadeau from Stanford. You know, it's important to me because it's growing it from 1997 to now. Peanut allergies have grown 50%. Wow, I did not know that. And tree nut allergies have grown, I think they've tripled since 1997. Wow. So, you know, this is something that's only going to get more prevalent. Yeah. Right. And I will say, and I'll add that if that feels like doomsday to you, um, to the listener, <laughs> it shouldn't because there are resources out and there's so much research going on right now to prevent the immunoglobulin Mm -hmm. reaction, which is the IgE, which is immune response to the protein that your child is ingesting. Um, And there's a lot of research going on around peanut, but also there's something called Mm anti-IgE medicine that is being used in trials. And I think also some people have it um, like as a regular prescription now. I don't know if they're testing it with children. It's probably in trial with children. And um, it just Mm -hmm. suppresses the IgE response to Mm. like, I think it's, I want to say 69 proteins. Wow. Like major allergen proteins. So you can take it and it would prevent, uh, I guess in my opinion, it sounds like lactate where you can take it and then it would prevent you know, the immune reaction. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I think you take it like 30 days before you start Okay, going into like immunotherapy where you're taking again, small portions right. and digesting. It. That's kind of scary. Thinking back to your point about not having access to like just being dirty. Right. And then we have these COVID babies. When we think about living through COVID, it'll probably increase again. Right. It's just like, that's a good point that, I mean, that that's the trend. <laughs> I enrolled yeah. our son in an outdoor school this year. 
What is that? What is that? An outdoor school? I've never heard of that. Well, um, it's just full time outdoors. The only time you go inside is to go to the bathroom. Wow. And no matter what the weather is, you're outside in nature for like it's from nine to 12. So the whole time you're outside in the dirt and playing. There are three or six D's that help um, increase your immune system. And dirt is one of them. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if I could give him three hours a day, five days a week, where he can get dirt under his fingernails, um, Dr. Robin Chutkin talks about that. She's a gut doctor. Mm-hmm. And she says the best thing that you can do for your children is let them get dirt under their nails. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and so it's just so good for their immune system and their gut. We health. probably need to put that yeah. in twice, right? Like <laughs> repeat it again so <laughs> yeah. people know. I think people don't think about yeah. that. No, we're going to be getting manicures and asking for dirt under our nails. <laughs> I would love to add some dirt, please. Yes, just, thank you. <laughs> just sprinkle it in. Also, as a clean freak, I feel like the idea of your kid being dirty freaks me out so much. But I know, like everybody says it, right? That it's like the best thing you can do. Uh, allergies are increased in homes where they use bleach regularly. Um, anytime you do this, like over sanitization that probably like to Jess's point, COVID is probably going to lead to more of that. Right. I know I personally have been using right. more disinfectants than I probably ever have. And it's not great for your immune system. So we all need to back off on the bleach. <laughs> Yeah. Less detergent is another one of the D's and going green with your house products um, is one of the best things you can do for asthma and allergy. If you were to do like, like, look, nobody's going to be perfect, right? Like you can't always check every box, but if you can check one box going green with your house products, like whether you use, I don't know, apple cider vinegar or like an expensive Mm -hmm. organic product that you can find at Target or wherever, that is a huge change because you're not getting that full circulation too through your house. It's more stale mm-hmm. air. Yeah, that's great to know though. What are the other uh, four of the 60s, if you don't mind? I do know them. Um, one is dog. So having a dog the first year of your child's life oh. is an incredible way to increase their immune system. Diet, which is kind of given. Vitamin D, mm-hmm. which you want to give your kid food and high in fat so that they can absorb vitamin D. Mm-hmm. So like no skim milk guys, <laughs> dry skin care. I can't remember if you all touched upon it, but um, with food allergies, the hypothesis, which is being proven now by the top researchers at Stanford is that the reason our bodies create this immune response to certain proteins is that it gets through dry skin mm. and it, there's more ratio of it through skin than through the gut. And so the body marks it as an, an invader and attacks it. So if you create like lotion barriers on the skin, you can mm-hmm. create like a thicker barrier where those proteins won't access through the skin, especially like the first year, in my opinion, when you're introducing it. But, you know, allergies happen. Sure. You can have late onset allergies too. So like you know, always being aware and creating that barrier. And I also think dirt used to create that barrier for us. And then we just are constantly Mm -hmm. washing and exfoliating and scrubbing and (laughs) peeling and all the stuff that we do. Right. And, um, and so to create, uh, an additional barrier is is important. How is having a child with food allergies just affected your, your life? It's, Or maybe it might be easier to say, how has it not? (laughs) Has it not affected your life? Yeah. No, you know, in the beginning, it affected my life in such a negative way. And uh, I was just so, there was so much despair. And I was just so lonely. And I was so hopeless and helpless. And I thought that this was like a life sentence. And I regretted becoming a mother. I was like, why me? Right. And those are like the quiet things I would whisper to myself, but I feel a lot of other food allergy mamas would say, I felt the same way when I got my child's diagnosis. I had dreams to travel the world, take my kid to Asia or Thailand and eat pad thai and Mm -hmm. like, you know, go to Africa and stay in a remote village where there's no healthcare and right. Like no access Mm -hmm. to emergency medicine. I don't know. Not that that was a big deal, but like, I never thought about that stuff, right? Like, 
And so I felt like it was, it cramped my mm-hmm. style so much. Right. And then I just, I started studying positive psychology, Dr. Martin Seligman and his colleagues at Penn have done so much work on mm. trauma, mm. post-traumatic stress. And they said that they they talk about research with the military and how you know people go into war and then the people that come back that don't have PTSD, like why them? And why does this other person yeah. have PTSD? And they talk about post-traumatic growth. And the people that don't have PTSD see those experiences in war and trauma mm-hmm as growth. So they were able to move out of that and say, wow, because I went through that, I'm stronger. Mm-hmm. I'm more resilient. I'm, I'm grittier. I'm, and they use these words that, you know, you find in certain um, characteristics of positive yeah. psychology, right? Courageous, brave, right? So it became a positive thing for them. And having this diagnosis for Oliver and being able to have two and a half years of time mm-hmm. with it, right? Like he was diagnosed at seven months and he's almost three years now. I'm able to see how small-minded our culture is and also understand how important it is to espouse inclusion and to do it in a positive way, a non-threatening way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a way that includes everybody, not just food allergies, but everybody. Hey, I'm not going to not invite you over to my party because you're type one diabetic, right? Like, yeah, I'm going to say, hey, what can I make? Like, I love to cook. So, you (laughs) know, like challenge me, give me some, you know, whatever. Yeah. And also like, let me eat like you for a night and see what that's like. Right. So how did you Uh, How did you teach Oliver about his food allergies or like, have you guys had those conversations yet? And if you have, what would you say are some Mm -hmm. good practices that listeners could potentially take forward? Mm -hmm. Great questions. So I'll start with the first one. How did I teach him about food allergies? So I started very young, right? And when you're Mm -hmm. so young, you understand simple concepts. So I kept it as simple as possible. But one thing I did do that I highly recommend even if it's later on in your child's life and your child is 13 years old and they have allergies. What I did was I focused on the positive. I'd say, we're allergic. And I would always say, we, Mm -hmm. we're, we're allergic to egg right now. And we're working on it Mm -hmm. because what happens is these children create fear of food and then they are afraid of all food. And food is such a beautiful incredible part of our lives, right? I spent 10 years of my life fighting my body image or more, 20 years of my life dieting Mm -hmm. and, you know, hating my body and trying to change it. And I learned from that experience how important a relationship, a positive relationship with what we're eating and our food, how important that is to us energetically, nutritionally, health-wise. Yeah. Um, So when you put instill that fear of food, you're kind of damping down that curiosity and zest for a simple pepper that's so crunchy and juicy, you know, instead of like, Mm -hmm. is it going to make me break out? Am I going to get hives? I'm afraid. But instead saying we're allergic to eggs right now. We're allergic to peanut right now and we're working on it. Right. So, and we, and mommy gives you peanut. Only mommy gives you peanut every night and I measure it out. That's the only time we eat it. So we talk about that. And I say, you eat peanut Mm -hmm. every night in a measured portion. You eat egg every morning in a measured portion because we are uh, participating in something called oral immunotherapy, which is a type of Mm -hmm. ingesting the certain protein you're allergic to in small portions and then getting up to a maintenance portion size where eventually they could tolerate eating nine peanuts, which is like, I guess- a tablespoon or or two tablespoons of peanut butter. So if he took a big chunk out of his friend's sandwich or whatever, yeah, there's different, there's so many different types of therapies. Um, sure. Some are like food freedom where you could actually order a PB and J. Now I drill him with questions and I make it fun because he's going to preschool. Right. So before mm-hmm. we leave the house, mm-hmm. I'm trying to teach him to advocate for himself and have agency, which is super important because you're never going to be with your kid yeah. all the time. So I say, yeah. What do we always remember when we leave the house? And he says, 
EpiPen. <laughs> and we do like some dorky dance. I'm like, you got it. You got it. Oh, yeah. You got it. And then, and then Love that. we get the EpiPen. And so what I do is I drill in with those questions. And then I say, school's coming up in a few weeks and I'll right now. So I'm prepping him and I say, and then what do you say to your teacher every time you go to the playground? Did you have my EpiPen? And I say, you got to stump her and make sure that she always has it. And she'll laugh, you know, like make it fun and positive and not scary. Because again, we're all different. We all have different situations going on. We all have different health things. And, you know, it's just his journey and Mm -hmm. it is what it is. So I think part of my journey of learning radical self-acceptance with body image is also just radical acceptance in general and then doing the best you can. So I drill in with those questions. And I know we mentioned uh, that we're going to talk about the book that I'm writing for Food Allergy Mamas. um, And I'm also creating a deck so that you can leave like a card deck, Mm -hmm. uh, like a gaming deck Mm -hmm. by your front door and just like pull a question. And I have a different categories and stuff. You pull a question and you challenge your kid before you leave the door. And that always just one quick thing. You can do it in the morning at breakfast. You can do it when you leave the door. I like to do it when I leave the door. Mm -hmm. It's like tying your shoes or something. And that way you're like, you have that accountability to practice all the time. One of the biggest Mm -hmm issues and and challenges I see as a food allergy mama is I'm too busy. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have the time. It's too much to even listen to a podcast. Some people can listen to a podcast, but like, I can't even get a 20 minute yoga class in because I'm cooking the next meal at home. Like we don't go out to eat ever. And I'm just overwhelmed. Right. Right. But if you can have like one question a day, right. Like just quick drill them before they head out. Um, and teach them agency or, you know, whatever it is. I have a vowel method that I use. It's agency, education, inclusion, optimism, under control, and you first. And so I teach this method um, to food allergy mamas and or caregivers. And um, those are like ways that I help him understand his food allergies, keep a positive spin on it. Mm-hmm. Again, practice radical acceptance and yeah, give him agency and when you're a kid, man, owning and having agency is like cool. It's like having a poor show when you're like yeah. <laughs> in your midlife crisis. Uh-huh. I love 100%. that you do that. I used to teach um, and I have very distinct memories of when I taught fifth grade and parents of children who have allergies are not to be trifled with. <laughs> like when they come in, <laughs> they have a folder, they have a checklist for you. They're like, here's the one he keeps, the inhaler, here's the EpiPen he keeps in his backpack, here's the one for his classroom. And I think that the kids would then also be like really strict with themselves. But when you include it in the conversation, then it's not, it becomes a non-issue in his, like I did a buddy system and his buddy would be like, bro, you need to get your EpiPen. Like, I don't know what you think we're going, you know, with, it's EpiPen time. And I think that's where that inclusion mm. can be like a community building thing. And then it's not, you know, Jaden's allergy. It's like my, aller- like, it's my issue too. That's my friend. That's my buddy. It's my system too. It's yeah. like a classroom part of the, part of their experience. And I would just, I always remember the food. I knew who they were because they would come in with folders, with (laughs) with bags. I'm like, I know you're going to tell me a lot of things and I'm ready to listen. (laughs) Yeah, That's great. And you're giving the other kid agency too. I'm like, what an awesome responsibility to care for somebody who's different than you. And to understand that the world is that way. And that is a better, better representation of what the world actually looks like. Yeah, it probably teaches them both so much. Right. I love that. If we could make this a bit about an Oliver Appreciation podcast (laughs) moment, can you tell us? I have seen (laughs) pictures of him because, of course, I stalked your blog, and he is so cute. He's adorable. If you could tell us just a bit about what he loves in life and, like, just living with Oliver. (laughs) Um, He is uh, just a curious kid, loves all the kid things, right? He likes to build. He likes to get his fingers in the dirt. He likes bugs. He likes um, medical stuff. He likes building hospital situations and triage our boo-boos when we bang them on the cabinet, which he wants us to do (laughs) regularly. (laughs) One of the things that stands out with Ollie 
is that his vocabulary is so incredible because I attribute it to not only being locked up with a mom who loves to read during a pandemic and talk because <laughs> I was like, let's talk sophistication also. <laughs> and let me read you a poem. Love I'm like <laughs> trying to memorize poems so I can like look cool and pull a party trick the next time we like can be around <laughs> people where we don't have to wear masks. Sure. But really, I think it came from having to put on your big boy britches, right. if you want me to say that, at the allergist office and to say, yeah, mommy, my mouth mm. itches. And in the beginning, it wasn't even as sophisticated as that. He's like, itchy, 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 itchy. Or now he sometimes says he has a choke up. So I got to choke up. I got to choke up if it's a respiratory right. issue. Yeah. Um, and then there's other things that are just uh, completely visual, which is another thing that I teach in uh, my methodology um, is visual cues for nonverbal mm -hmm. children. And it's something I also teach to restaurants and hospitality is how to train their managers or, or people on staff to look for those um, visual cues where, you know, bright red eyes, runny nose, itchiness. It's, it's really right. something you can pick up very quickly because it's obviously not, you know, a cold or whatever. It's like, whoa, it just whew, came on. Right. It feels like they should have allergy. You know how they have posters of all the things that restaurants i mean that should be wash your hands right up there like yeah. that should be a law i'm working on it right now okay perfect <laughs> very cool yeah. like stroke cpr they have those up everywhere yeah. they should absolutely have like allergy response yes i'm working with friedman's in new york city which is already a gluten-free restaurant mm -hmm. and they're very allergy aware they're an incredible restaurant and the owner is um, they have several landmark locations, one in Times Square, one in Chelsea Market, the Upper mm -hmm. West Side, they're all over New York City, uh, super health mm -hmm. conscious and allergy inclusive. And of course, you are taking a risk when you go to a restaurant, right? But if you know that there are layers of protection, you feel a little bit better about it. So sure. having a restaurant carry an EpiPen and having, or two EpiPens, right? Yeah. In case right. you forget, yeah, there is human error, right? Um, having somebody on site always who's trained in an emergency action plan, which is yeah. very simple. Having refresher courses because sometimes you forget, you know, what mm -hmm. was it? Did I call 911 yeah. first or inject the EpiPen? Did I do this? Right. Just a refresher course. Mm -hmm. Checking the expiration date on their EpiPens in the restaurant and making sure that all you know, just little things that we can do to include layers of protection on the hospitality side so that right. families and children with food allergies can feel included and live a life like people who don't have food allergies because we eat all day long, right? We're human. Right. So why yeah. would you just say it's too much liability to have you in here? Like, you know, there's disability laws that allow handicapped people to have access into restaurants. Right. And if they don't have access yeah. into the restaurant, they can sue that restaurant, right? Exactly. So why don't we protect or at least include and put layers of protection in to hospitality and events and schools, which are happening right. to help these children on that end, in addition to helping the mothers, in addition to giving them the mindfulness and well-being resources to... Yeah follow through with the emergency action plan to inject an avihu to feel positive psychology and um you know the hunting the good stuff if you will yeah and and feeling curiosity with food and going to the farmer's market and saying oh I'd like to try something new with you and yeah and when we were doing the research for the episode it's funny that you bring up like restaurants because I didn't realize before we did the research for that episode, I didn't realize, for instance, that foamed milk in a cafe can be a trigger for someone who has a milk allergy, even if they're just inhaling milk protein that is in the air in their like vicinity. It doesn't even have to be near them to trigger an anaphylaxis response. And the idea of that sounds so... Um, it sounds so scary, but I think that what you're talking about, creating action plans, having staff that is trained to do things like this, like it almost sounds like it's less of a liability to do those things. Yeah. <laughs> for these restaurants, for these cafes, like if you know these things are potentially life threatening for people, why wouldn't you do it? 
Yeah. And why wouldn't you participate in inclusion, right? Yeah. We're, we're only mm-hmm. on this rock flying through the air for such a short period of time. And, you know, we think about our profit margin and this and that, and it might actually be better for your company to yeah. be a part of this right. inclusive, you know, buzzword that we're going through right now. Um, but also to feel like a good human and to say, you know, like, I, I did something right. Yeah. Part of the response hopefully comes from the, like the advocacy work that you're doing, because I think more than anything, the response that we got from our episode was I had no idea. Like most of the people who reached out to us just said, I had no idea this was a thing. I had no idea how prevalent this was. I had no idea that like me opening a bag of peanuts in a public space could potentially be harmful to someone. Or a child's park. Right. Yeah. So the advocacy work that you're mm-hmm. doing is like so important for in that space. But what are some of the things that you wish everyone knew about food allergies? Oh, gosh, that we're, we're you know, the same, right? Like we just have our own little quirk and extra medical equipment that we carry around. Fortunately, I expose my son to a world, I can expose my son to a world where those allergens do exist. I do it um, with risk management. Um, But for the people who can't do that, can't afford to do that, don't know they can do that, we need to be careful about what we bring into public spaces where there is very little risk management. And what I mean by that is schools, playgrounds, um, public transportation, Mm -hmm. um, things where people need subways, uh, buses, airplanes, events, making sure that um, my husband and I Mm -hmm. own a part of a wellness festival called Wonderlust. And one of my goals is to make it, I I told my husband privately, I'm like, look, I I could never bring Oliver to that event because I would never know if he would be able to eat there. Yeah. And I don't want to be eating allergy free Fig Newton bars the whole day, right? Like, I want to know that that event yeah. is going to be allergy inclusive. So I think that um, there needs to be accountability. And we, as the food allergy community, I did a poll on my Instagram stories yesterday about some of the biggest hangups and issues that we have um, with restaurant ordering. And a lot of people said, you know, I just call ahead. And if they say, don't eat here, um, they're like, oh, I'm grateful, you know? And I'm like, well, tell me how you really feel. And they're like, well, at first I'm grateful that they're at least honest and they tell us that they can't serve us safely. But then I feel a little bit lonely and like um, unincluded and like, you know, that wasn't very inclusive of them to, you know, just kind of say, we can't do that for you. Right. And I was a champion of size inclusion for 10 years of my life. I traveled the world as a plus size model doing inclusion. I know inclusion. I know how to do this. And so this whole chapter of my life is doing the same thing. It is barking and it is going and holding accountability and it is radically accepting the journey and it is being loud and being loving and being kind and thoughtful and educating. I um, launched the first size inclusive, non descript size. It was just from size zero to 22 lingerie line with Cosa Bella in 2014. And we were the very first lingerie line that ever came out that just put all the sizes together and not said, hey, if you're a plus size shop here. And um, and I can do that with food allergies because yeah. why do we separate kids at the peanut table at school? Yeah. Mm. But if you're just going to like isolate them for liability reasons and not try and understand or take a little a refresher course on how to protect my child and how to make them feel included. Like, I just feel like your $50,000 education where you're like, oh, we have this chef from this wonderful restaurant that we hired to, you know, bring to school. And then you're going to sit and get at a peanut table. Like you can do better. We can do better. Right. And we don't have to be mean about it, but we can do better. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of chapters, right, um, you're writing a book. I mean, we've already kind of touched on that. We love that. Can you just speak about 
why that came up. Um, you've already been an advocate, as you said, for other issues. You're like well ingrained in, in several different advocacy pathways. So why a book for who? Yeah. And just give us some, you know, some deets. We'll definitely buy it. <laughs> With no children, we'll buy. It. Well, you'll love, <laughs> you'll <read> love <laughs> the recipes in the back. Um, okay, perfect. I, sure will. I have created um, some go-to recipes oh, for cool. cakes. And so oh, every wow. one of the biggest problems with food allergies is kids don't get invited to birthday parties because oh, there's yeah. so many allergens at the parties. So they're constantly saying no. And at every party of a cake. So I started oh. a food allergy cake company right before COVID. It was a fun thing for me, and my girlfriend, and we called it Good Mama. And in the cakes, we put vegetables, which like zucchini makes a cake super moist. Mm -hmm. um, and I love to cook. So like, to me, it was so much fun. And we had such a good time. Oh, yeah. And, um, and I use all allergy inclusive swaps. So I use egg replacers and like healthy, whatever, um, dairy free. So I was selling right. these cakes for $400 a piece overnight. It just exploded. So I was like, I don't want to be a baker. I was wow. doing it for my son. And then I realized when I started posting it, that everyone had yeah. someone who had a food allergy right and these cakes are the best tasting cakes my zucchini spice cake which you would never picture to be a kid's cake is outrageous I mean it's and I have a brown butter frosting it's outrageous and you're just oh, like that sounds good <laughs> oh my god it's full of zucchini I put like seven zucchinis in it you would never know it's wow insane it is absolutely insane people go nuts over it I had like the who's who of Miami Beach buying it and bringing it out on yachts and I'm like I don't know if I'm frosting this right. Like I'm learning how to do like a <laughs> naked cake, but they're like, it tastes so good. Like we don't get yeah. And so the book though, it all started from the moment of despair. So I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so alone. Well, people know me. A lot of people know me. Not to say that I'm like a celebrity, but I'm just saying it's my duty since I've been given that um, they can go on the internet and search food allergies and I will pop up as yep. <laughs> yeah you do yeah as a resource <laughs> Verified. Yeah. and you know to say oh my gosh I only had to search one time and then Emily gave me a huge download the book is is in three sections I have like a memoir style um I have the self-help with my methodology and then I have some recipes and it's not the medical side which I have like the end of food allergy highly recommend books like that Mm -hmm. um, for more medical information, I will go over it in like a, Hey mama, this is actually what's going on. Mm -hmm. Here's the cliff notes, that type of thing. You'll get that, yeah. but it's more of the mama's journey, how to manage the emotional side of it, how to, you know, see the positive psychology of it, be mindful, teach your kid agency, educate people, yeah. you know, how to lobby for a sign in the park that just says, thanks for keeping our park allergy friendly here are the nine allergens and have pictures of them yep. and then parents are like oh oh I never thought cheese crackers could kill this yep. child like you know yeah. like I've been bringing goldfish to the park like next time I'll bring carrot sticks or whatever you know apple mm -hmm. slices um because who cares right like that's nothing exactly to them. yeah they can simple just swap choose yeah simple swap and so, and then I have recipes. So it's three sections and it all started because I was like, I feel so alone. I have no resources. There's so much misinformation on this subject, even from yeah. double board certified allergists, right? It is constantly changing. And to encourage the mama or caregiver, I just say mama, because a lot of them are mamas taking care of their children because you're forced to, exactly. I mean, it, it became a full-time job for me. I had to give up. I gave up social media for like eight months because I was so overwhelmed with trying to take care of, of our son. And yeah. I was like, oh my God, I don't know. Like if I'm putting him at risk by being on social media, you know, I had no idea. So I wanted to know one time I want to save money. I want to save time. I want to have the correct information. I want to have my go-to recipes for birthdays. I want to have downloadable emergency action plans. I want to have lists of things that I need, of questions I need to ask the pediatrician, of questions I need to ask the pediatric allergist. Um, I just want it all organized and prepared yeah. for me because I'm so overwhelmed right now and I have no idea what to do. So that's where the book came. And then I'm creating a course that 
goes with the book. And that way it's self-paced. It's something that you can do as soon as your baby goes down for a nap. Hmm. And that's something that I would have wanted to do. It's quick. It's self-paced. It's something you can do in bite-sized bits so that you can get it done during nap times when the baby's asleep. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when the baby's watching the <laughs> iPad, trash TV. Uh, so you can get it done in little bits. So you have the book, you have the course, and it, you know, it takes a day or two to get right. a book in Amazon Prime, depending on where you live. So sometimes yeah. you need the course because you've got that next meal coming up, right? So what do you do yeah. when you've got that next meal coming up and you're desperate? Like I left the first allergist and I was like, oh my God, I've been eating peanut butter, I've been eating eggs, I've been eating all this stuff. I had only been breastfeeding my kid not even a bottle, no formula. And he hands me a formula with fish oil. And he's like, well, we don't have a formula in the U S that is allergy inclusive for your son. So I overnighted this like hundred dollar formula for Germany. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take everything out of my diet. And I'm going to hope that like whatever he takes from my breast now doesn't kill him because he's been drinking it for a really long time and he's been okay. He's never yeah. had a hives reaction. Um, and what I learned, you know, after that experience was that allergist had no idea what he was talking about in our case, right? Like it is a case by case basis. Some allergists do recommend that the mama takes right. the food out of their diet and then breastfeeds. But I've had allergists also say, actually, that is oral immunotherapy. And if your kid is not having eczema or a reaction to your breast milk, you should continue. Again, this is not medical advice. This is just my case. You should yeah. have continued hmm. to get, eat, keep eating that stuff to tone your immunity and to mm -hmm. tone the baby's immunity and keep introducing. It's such a small amount through the breast milk. Yeah. Um, and so if it's not, you know, there's no blood in the stool, there's no, you know, signs of, um, of food allergies. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's just, again, so much misinformation, the breastfeeding thing, I fed him past two years of age and I followed his diet. I took everything. Right. And I took so much out of my diet and I just did it because I was like, if you have to do it, I will do it. Yeah. I'm going to survive. I love food and I love, love a challenge. So bring it on. I can get creative, Yeah. focus on something called simple sacred food. And it's just the appreciation of simple foods because when you have food allergies and you eat something that's like, casserole or things that are like hard to tell what's in there yeah you get a little uh -huh. <laughs> you're like oh, I'm suspicious right like yeah what's in this thing but if mm. you're eating a pepper and an apple and if you can eat cheese like a stick of cheese or mm. whatever like a slice of cheese right. you know what you're getting so you know we just ate very simply and it made us very healthy yeah. right I I felt super healthy um I felt proud that we could eat that way and that we had that opportunity and abundance to eat that way. And so that's why I created the book and the course and like a card deck and why I'm creating that now so that I can just make it a one-stop shop, save people from looking at and going to eight different allergists. I mean, there's thousands of dollars spent at each allergist, right? It's just yeah. unbelievable. You know, one of my hopes is to help the mama feel like, even though it might feel like doomsday, that it's temporary. It can be temporary. Like you yeah. will live with food allergies for the rest of your life. Um, however, there are things you can do and there are medicines being created right now yeah. that will help your child. Um, and, you know, with the right information and to keep searching for those doctors that you trust. And I will say that with all my experience in doctors, there is never a unicorn where you're like, oh my <laughs> gosh, where have you been my whole life? It's yeah. always, you know, okay, like this is, this is great. And um, as long as they're great, she has every award under her belt. Not that that matters. Cause I've been to somebody who's every award under their belt and totally was a bummer. Um, yeah. That's what it sounds like. But I think you have to trust yourself first, right? Because mm -hmm. you are the caregiver and they yeah. are your teammate, right? So you want to look for a teammate. I love that. I We, we talk yeah. about advocacy for self all the time in our, in our different episodes. I love that, you know, you know more about your kid than this person will when you walk into their office. So you already 100%. coming in saying, well, here's actually what we're going to do makes the difference. 
puts, first of all, people who have a position of power normally in those situations kind of on their heels. They were like, wait, I can't just say, which I'm not saying that every doctor does, but I, we've heard some things. <laughs> we really have. And so it, it puts the power back in your court and you are on your kid's side. So I feel that's just the best way, right? Yeah. And it really depends on what you want as the caregiver, right? Like I want Mm -hmm. to be an Olympic athlete in there. Like I want to know that I am fighting for my kid and doing the best I can. And I will say there have been times where I get flung back into this denial of like, ah, we're fine. It's smooth sailing. He hasn't had a reaction in a while. Like uh, maybe like we, you know, oh, I forgot the EpiPen and let's just fingers crossed, whatever. You really, with something this serious, you have to be an Olympic athlete. And I, I hate to say that because I know every mama listening is like, I was kind of hoping again, my kid would grow out of it. And they may, they, they (laughs) might, they might. Yeah. Um, but this is life or death. Right. And this is, um, One of those things, it's like if your child is deaf, right? You learn sign language. You just do because you have to, right? Yep. Um, And so you just just adapt. You adapt. And it's kind of like a gray area, right? Because it's a hidden illness in a way until you see the hives and the reaction. Um, So you're like, oh, my kid is normal, right? Normal, small-minded. And and then you're just flung into reality again and again and again. And the only way to not be so afraid and in such despair is to educate yourself and learn this verb method that I go over and teach mamas super quickly. Yeah. How can a person who isn't directly impacted by food allergies be an ally and be food allergy inclusive in their daily life? Great question. Um, Preparing foods at parties that are food allergy friendly And if, you know, asking the food allergy caregiver that or mama, you know, hey, is it an airborne thing? Can, can this be, be there? Um, Would you, what would you prefer? What's your preference? Um, And just making a party inclusive. Um, And the second thing I will say that I have been so, so um, just overjoyed to hear the story is how many stories of children's best friends have saved their life because the child knew how to inject the EpiPen or the AviQ. Mm-hmm. And so to train your child, if you were listening to this and your child does not have food allergy or does have food allergies, train your child what signs to look for in their best friend, in a classmate. Teachers should be doing this and should halt the class every four months, they should have a refresher course, a four minute refresher course and say, Hey guys, so we're just going to quickly go over all these allergies really quick. And, you know, sometimes for example, I don't really publicly share what allergens my son is allergic to because that's his privacy Mm -hmm. and that's his, his thing. If he wants to share it. Um, but because I'm kind of a public personality, I don't want people knowing what my son is definitely allergic to, right? Like yeah. I want his care, his school people right. to know. I want maybe the small families in the class, but just to say like, here's the signs to look for. And like, yeah. just make sure like you, that we're on it because we're a team and we're a class and we're together and we are inclusive. And, you know, like yeah. I get super excited about that stuff because I played sports my whole <laughs> life and love like teamwork and collaboration. And I think children just thrive on yeah. that. So that would be the other thing is just like prepare your child to see the world in what a direct reflection of the world looks like. We go to first or American Red Cross to get CPR certified. We should be food allergy certified. Everyone should know what a food allergy looks like and, you know, what a mild response is versus a severe response. Mm -hmm. And, and even I would go as far as to say, you know, people should know what the difference between an allergy and an intolerance is, especially in like hospitality, right? Like, Yep. Oh, is this an allergy? If so, like, let me go get the manager who's trained in food, our food allergy emergency action plan, and he'll be serving you tonight, or she'll be serving you tonight. And then when you, and one of the things Friedman's in New York City does is um, right now they do it with gluten, but you will be getting 
they say this at the table and you order a gluten-free meal, you'll be getting a flag in your gluten-free sandwich that says gluten-free. If there's no flag in your sandwich, please let us know and we'll bring you another one. Oh, that's fantastic. Layers of protection, layers of protection, layers of protection, inclusivity. Yeah. I know I have a friend who um, has uh, celiacs and she can't have, you know, any gluten at all. And I came to a party once and I brought lemon bars that I had gotten from an allergy website and made it with coconut flour. And Mm -hmm. I remember it was like the only thing that she could eat at the entire party. Mm -hmm. And she was so appreciative. So I feel like the more we can do for people who are often left out, it's like, it's such a simple swap to make. It's such an easy thing to do, but it's so it's so meaningful, right? And how fun to use coconut flour. I mean, like everyone must have been so yeah. intrigued and like, there's coconut flour in this? This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you have been so generous with your time. Um, we have both yeah, like obsessed and poured <laughs> over your blog. Um, you've done so many cool things and you're doing so much cool stuff for the allergy advocacy and everything that you do is so awesome. We have one last question for you before we let you go. Cause I'm sure you're insanely busy. We're asking everyone that we interview, how do you take your coffee? Hot and <laughs> early in the morning and dark. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> and anyway, right. <laughs> anyway, if it's an espresso, if it's a pour over, just put it in my my body as soon as possible (laughs) i love that that's the same woman after our hearts for sure (laughs) (laughs) thank you both so much for everything that you've done for malpractice and the research that you do you're phenomenal i was so impressed with the amount of energy and love that you put into your first episode or part of this series around food allergies Um, Not only because I am a food allergy mama and caregiver, but also because it just educated me and brought so much real hard information and data, um, which is what we need in the world. And thank you for doing that and for bringing it to us and publishing that. Thank you so much. That's so sweet of you. (laughs) You are so infectious positive yes <laughs> you have a very yeah. great energy i love it thank you so much for for interviewing with us this is incredible thanks for having me i really appreciate it hey mal pals thanks for listening the sources and links for this episode can be found in our show notes if you haven't already go follow us on social media you can find us on instagram facebook and twitter at malpractice podcast You can also send topic suggestions, questions, or concerns to our email, malpracticepodcast at gmail.com. And just as a reminder, if you like what you're hearing, you should definitely subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. And don't forget, malpractice makes perfect.